But there are some glorious examples of the opposition of that, and the opposite of that. One could be ILWU, the longshoremen in San Francisco, Local 10. They were, their, their whole nature of how they organize and why they will take direct action is based on the question of class solidarity and is also based on the question of educating not only their members but the community and is based on the question of solidarity across borders. So they'll go on strike to support the anti-apartheid movement. They'll go on strike to oppose the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and Iran. They understand members, not every single member, but it's, that's the culture within their union. That's the culture that needs to exist in all the unions to fight back. But then that's also the culture that needs to be perpetuated in our communities since less than 9% of people are in unions. So we can, they have to be the lead. They don't see the fact that we have, one, we have organization as a union. Two, we have money. In many places, you have a building where you can meet, which means a lot. You have resources. You have a way to communicate and mobilize people. So but we, don't, we underestimate that, because what's promoted is taking whatever crumbs you can get instead of taking the whole pie, and the whole pie would be what both Fred and Monica talked about. The whole pie is you have the ability, if you can run a transportation system in New York City, you also have the potential to run this damn city. Mm -hmm. If you have the potential to run agencies every day that service people, you have the potential to run this city. If you have the ability to develop and produce things that could be useful and come up with more creative ideas and designs on how to make them be better in safety, you have the ability to run this country. And that's what an independent workers' movement is supposed to be about. So the question then comes down to, for example, in 2004, when we fought for an independent million workers' march, which would talk about the rank and file members coming together, both public and private sector. People came from Japan, they came from Haiti, they came from South Africa, they came from Europe to be part of that effort. Why was it in the mind of the leadership of AFL-CIO to say, oh no, we can't do that now, we're having an election for the Democrats, and that will confuse the workers. For them to independently organize and put forth their demands, many of the demands are the same demands that people are talking about now, whether it's education against the war, for people not being uh, under the Taylor law that clamps down on people's ability to use their best weapon, which is to withhold your labor, which is the power that workers are not taught to understand. That is your key. You, you cannot run this city. Bluebird would learn this in 30 minutes. If everybody took a 30 minute absence and did not go to work or were at work and did nothing, the city would shut down. And that would be the message to the ruling class that we are the real power and we have the ability. So we have to do a lot of, of education of the history of resistance, education to be independent thinkers, education to question why is it the working class in the United States has never had a full-blown independent working class party? I mean, that's just not even getting to the socialist parties that we need to really do the whole finale, <laughs> but to even get to the point to say, can we say, can we run our own candidates? Can we have a slate that means something to us that we came up with? Can we have them not manipulated by the wealthy people? But here, when people tried, again, the Million Worker March was one example, then you had the Labor Party being formed in 1996. Who opposed that party? Who tried to sabotage that party? Who created an alternative, so-called alternative party in New York City, like the Working Families Party, which was just a mouthpiece and a subterfuge from people who were interested in waking up to say, I want an independent party. Oh, well, let's run candidates. We'll run Democratic candidates like Valone. Mm -hmm. Now, how could you run somebody with that kind of baggage and say that he represents the working class? So it's really trying to break that. That's why it's important to define what you represent and to have demands and to have a vision. You can't build a movement if you don't have a vision. You can't build a movement about what you want to achieve if you don't have spelled out. Because it's not like people don't know what they want. Everybody is living in this world. As you said, we're not living on another planet. You know what's wrong. But they're convinced workers that they don't know what's wrong. And I just want to tie in one example 
tying into what um, Monica, Monica had brought up. Right after the Civil War, one of the biggest, most valuable labor forces was the slaves who worked for free and produced eons of money that people are still living <coughs> off of today. And the biggest concern of the ruling class at that time was what are we going to do with these people? And what conclusion did they come up with? And you should all read this book. I'm sorry I didn't bring it with me because I loaned this one. It's called The White Establishment and Black Education from 1865 to, um, I think it goes up to uh, 1954, right before the, uh, the Brown versus the Board. There, they came to the conclusion that we can't have these people out here who was recently freed just operating willy-nilly on their own with their own interpretation of the world. We must shape and control their interpretation of the world because these people potentially, I mean, they organized rebellions, they organized to get themselves free, they connected with Haiti and, and Brazil and other, no, we cannot have that. We must control that. So we're gonna train teachers, we're gonna create schools, and we're gonna control every, and we're gonna fund them so we make sure they go the way they want. If you read this book, this brother documented everything. It wasn't his interpretation of what happened. He actually used their words, and he had documents from their words. He had books. He has documents of conversations that were said in certain meetings, and that was their plan. And why do I bring this up? Because one thing that I, if I haven't learned anything else is that the ruling class never <laughs> stops using tactics that work very successfully for them. And one of the taxes, one of the things that worked very successful to them is to control how you think, how we think. And they were very clear that this was a very serious force of people that we must control. That's why they worked very hard on organized labor, because they know what your potential is as organized labor, and they want you to never wake up, be the sleeping giant, and know how to use it. The same thing with the slaves. So they actually set up schools like Tuskegee, Hampton Institute, you know, <laughs> Hampton Institute as they used to call it in the South. And the purpose of it was actually to train people who would never think about challenging the system. Of course, that, that didn't always, because you always have somebody, some bodies who wake up and say, I'm not gonna accept the program. But that was their purpose. And their purpose was to continue to have a working force that would go buy into this capitalist system being the best thing after white sliced bread and never think about anything as an alternative and embrace it and want to be always part of it and never think about any alternative. So to me, that informs me about what we have to do. We have to work 24 seven to educate workers about their real potential, about their real history, and for them to have space where they can sit down and strategize about how they are going to be able to deal with this monster and take it down. Because that's the only, you can't patch it up. Mm -hmm. And as Fred aptly described, it's at, on his last leg, but just like wounded monsters, they can be on their last leg and they're gonna still find a way to strike out at you. And so we have to be able to harness that because when it, when it falls, not if it falls, it has to be something in place for us to move to the kind of society that all of us deserve. There are opportunists laying in the cut all the time to take us someplace else. So we have to develop and strengthen and <coughs> foster the best elements within our society. The best elements. And that's people who feel that they will take whatever it needs to build and fight for and forage the kind of society that we need. So we need to look, when we in the public sector, those of us who are in the public sector, we need to be about organizing within our own unions to be able to get alternative information out to people and to talk about what's going on. Those of us who are not in unions and they want to know what should I do, or if you're, if you're lucky enough to have a job, then you need to also organize that place. You need to organize it. 